The Department of Human Services is made up of hundreds of employees whose job it is to protect children who have been the victims of abuse and neglect. It is a job that can be stressful and overwhelming. And because of a lawsuit filed against DHS alleging abuse of children while in state care, employees in the entire agency have been under intense scrutiny. DHS was about as broken as I have seen a system, frankly. Um, and all you have to do is look at the stories of some of the individual plaintiffs that we represent in this case. So um, what marked the DHS system um, and continues to, to a great degree to mark the DHS system is that the state has one of the worst rates of abuse and care of any system in the country. That is, when children come under the state's protection, um, they nevertheless are subjected to further harm, which is um, something I think, frankly, taxpayers ought to be absolutely outraged at. Attorney Marsha Lowry is the executive director of New York-based Children's Rights. She sought reform within DHS by filing a class action lawsuit on behalf of more than 10,000 children who had been removed from their homes by DHS. The case was recently settled out of court, but if the case had gone forward, Shelley Munoz would have been one of the witnesses. She has adopted three siblings who came to live with her through foster care, two of whom suffered abuse. She was sexually abused um, twice, two different homes, um, at, you know, minimum. My son, uh, I never did find out what the abuse allegations were. They wouldn't tell me, um, which is absurd. I mean, he's my son. He's my adopted son, and I have no idea what the abuse allegations were. Shelley says what her children suffered at the hands of DHS is inexcusable. First of all, she says one of the girls was delivered to her home by a caseworker who failed to inform Shelley the six-year-old had severe psychiatric problems and suffered from violent rages. That first night with the child, Shelley said the six-year-old was out of control and that frantic calls to the caseworker were unanswered. The next day, the caseworker agreed to return to Shelley's home. All the shelters were full, which I'm guessing is why she wouldn't call me back to begin with. And uh, she took her down to Lawton to a shelter there. Now, this is a child who I've since adopted. So you can imagine what kind of trauma that was to have, to know that your adoptive mother turned you away within the first 12 hours of knowing you. Her child eventually went to several different therapeutic foster care homes before she was returned to Shelley. It was the girl's previous foster parent who filled Shelley in about dealing with DHS. And she had complained and informed the caseworker for a year and a half that this behavior was going on and nothing had been done. Frankly, if I were a different kind of person, if I had a less assertive personality, my poor child would still be in foster placements where um, she wasn't getting the care that she needed. In the meantime, Shelley was waiting to get the girl's three-year-old brother into her home. One day, Shelley said a DHS worker called and said the home the boy was in was being shut down because of allegations of abuse. Shelley said she would gladly take him, but just give her three hours because she was tied up in an important business meeting. She said, we'll drop him at your daycare. And I said, no, you can't drop a three-year-old at a strange daycare where his sister is, who he hasn't seen in a year and a half. And uh, she said, either we drop him at your daycare or we give him to somebody else. Marsha Lowry has studied many such cases. It has been a system in which children have um, not been um, given access to permanent families. Um, and while they've been in the state's custody, have been shifted from one temporary placement to another and subject to harm while they've been in the state's custody. Now, that's in a public system. That's in a system that is designed to protect children. The DHS system was not protecting children. And that's why we brought the lawsuit. The case lingered for four years until a settlement agreement was reached this January. In the settlement, DHS agrees to reform its system involving areas such as worker caseloads, visitations to foster children, increasing the number of foster homes, emergency shelter use, and child abuse and neglect while in the state's care. I think there will be uh, niches of changes uh, is how I would characterize it. I think uh, we want to try to improve in certain areas uh, significantly. The main, one of the main areas where we want to really improve, which we've always said we wanted to improve, is to have a better, uh, richer choice of 
foster homes for workers to be able to make placements. There's always a need for quality foster families. DHS Director Howard Hendrick disputes many of the allegations made in the lawsuit. He says it's all how you look at the data. He says Oklahoma has higher standards than many states, so more abuse in the system is discovered. We've had a long history, actually, of very good visitation rates for children in foster care. So, I mean, states that may have a better uh, maltreatment rate than we do, well, look at their visitation rate. It's probably not that hot. So one of the reasons why I think uh, we do find the abuse and neglect in our system or is we, we visit. We had a very high rate of visitation. An average month, 95% of the kids who need a visit get a visit every month. Hendrick says they are always working on improving the child welfare system, but he is welcoming any suggestions to make it better. In the settlement agreement, three individuals called co-neutrals who have strong credentials in child welfare will be working with DHS to reach the demands of the settlement. I see their role as very, very constructive and completely neutral. And I think one of the values of having these people involved is that they are people that have been chosen by both sides, by both plaintiffs and defendants. So they are looking at the results, um, but they're also looking at the steps DHS needs to take to achieve those results. And if necessary, um, they can go to the judge and have orders entered uh, if there is a problem with DHS taking the necessary steps. The people who work at DHS, whom we talked to for this story, say change is already happening. Do you think it started to make some changes in light of the lawsuit? I do believe that, yes. In what way? Um, I, I feel like we understand that we, we're kind of at the focus of everyone's attention right now, and uh, we're very aware of that. And that has kind of spurred us to examine our own daily practices, what we're doing um, from the, the level of the field workers all the way up. The workers say they hope the co-neutrals will come to understand their heavy caseloads and what they're up against every day. You can be sitting at your desk working and then the police who are right across the hallway, we've got a child death, you're going. It doesn't matter, you drop what you're doing and you go out with them. Um, you can have an average a day of sometimes getting two or three emergencies that day that you're having to go out on. The child can call us anytime. This job is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week job. And the child, um, if the child is old enough, I do give that child my phone number and I make sure that the foster parent has all of my phone numbers to um, be able to get a hold of me in case the child has a question, in case there's a crisis. Turnover of employees is a problem. Besides the stress, Hendricks says employees haven't had raises in five years and that foster Foster parent stipends haven't increased for some in 20 years. I think the public is going to have to make some decisions about how we're going to fund uh, services. We can talk about taxes all we want to, but at some point the, the, the safety net today is strained about as hard as it's ever been strained. Rhonda Ferguson, a senior at Oklahoma State University, can talk of another kind of strain. She was removed from her home by DHS at 15, separated from her three siblings, and lived with different people. During that time, it caused me to be very miserable, um, very sad, depressed, because I f didn't feel like I got the proper help that I needed. How did you get through it? Uh, I do, I will say that going through all that, it did make me a stronger person. I feel like, you know, if I hadn't went through all that, I wouldn't be the person that I am today. She is excelling in school and working part-time. With a degree in human development and family science, she plans on finding work in social services, perhaps at DHS, where she can be part of the reform. According to the settlement, DHS must come up with a plan and be evaluated on its success by 2016, but those involved hope the reforms can be accomplished before that.